Thank you all for being here today. It's wonderful to have each and every one of you, especially those of you who are watching live stream. Thank you in Jesus' name. You have many things that you could be doing, but you chose as married, uh, not married, but yes, married. You chose the good thing. Hallelujah. Glory. You may be seated in the presence. Thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to take a, a little uh, little detour, but we're not done with the things that we spoke of before, especially with uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth, the three brothers. Um, of course, Abel probably never got to know his brother Seth until after Seth went on to glory. Um, but Cain himself was more than likely around at the time that Seth was birthed. And uh, Seth, in his generation, inspired men to start calling upon the name of the Lord. It was in his time. And we know that after that, throughout the lineage of Seth, there were men and women who called upon the name of God, and then that all led up towards the man Noah, and Noah himself built that ark with his three sons because God was so fed up with men by Genesis chapter 6 that he's like, I regret and I repent for having made man. It's one of the saddest passages of scripture in the Bible itself when the one who created us is so disappointed in us that he says, I regret or I repent for having made man for he is indeed, he's evil, and he only continues to get evil. And uh, God never created us to be evil. I know that may be a shock to some, but you got to look at your neighbor and say, God never created us to be evil. He created us to be good. Everything that he had created was good. And he gave mankind dominion over this earth. He had authority and power over this earth to rule this earth the way dad rules heaven. Jesus, in the prayer, when his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, like John taught his disciples to pray. And it's like, Lord, teach us how to communicate with God, because, you know, that's expected from God's people, his children, his church, that they have communication with him. Lord, teach us how to uh, pray the way John taught his disciples how to pray. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray after this manner. Say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts or trespasses, even as we forgive the debts and trespasses of others who trespass or are indebted to us. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so God's dominion or God's rulership is to be executed here on earth, and it's to be executed by his own people. He gave us that dominion in the beginning, that authority in the beginning. It was given over or relinquished to Satan. Jesus came and took it back. He took it back and gave it to the church of the living God. He gave us the right and the authority to now be the sons, daughters of the Most High God, the offspring of God, according to John chapter 1, verse 12. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power. That word power is exousia, the authoritative power to become sons of God, the right, if you will, to be sons, daughters of God. And so here we are operating as a church of the living God, the people of God, called by his name, called out of darkness, called from shame. People who have settled things in their hearts that I have been crucified with Christ. According to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said it to the church at Galatia, but he also said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. So 
Paul's life was in following Jesus. And then he said, now you need a living example. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now Jesus had already ascended and was seated at the right hand of the Father by the time the, by the, time the Apostle Paul got saved. But he got gloriously saved and then had conversation with Jesus in heaven concerning the things that concern the church of the living God. And he, through the divine revelation that God gave him, imparted all of that wisdom and knowledge to the church. One of the passages that I quoted earlier had to deal with being filled with all the fullness of God. That is what Jesus taught the apostle Paul, and by the Holy Ghost, he wrote it to the church at Ephesus, saying, this is the pattern, this is the path, this is what you look for, this is what you long for, this is what you strive for, this is what you believe. And he said, be continually filled with the Spirit of God. So there's more than just one filling. The initial filling is the ability to pray or speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance. That gives you the ability to build yourself up, as Jude said in verse 20, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That is uh, something for believers to do. It's not a suggestion by Jude. It's him being the half-brother of the Lord, growing up, seeing Jesus come into the fullness of his ministry and all, and didn't really recognize him for who he was until he died on that cross, was buried in that grave, and three days later rose from the dead and was seen for 40 days, even at one time, by over 500 people. That's when they got the revelation of who their big brother really was, that he was the Christ, the Messiah. He was the anointed one and still is. But they didn't, they didn't acknowledge it while he was on this earth. They were out there with their mother trying to get Jesus to lead the disciples so that they can, he could come out there with them and accompany them or talk to them or be with them. Maybe they wanted to go do something as a family. And Jesus says, who is my family? The church of this day can't handle that kind of talk because they think that that's just so either sacrilegious or so wrong or so, you know, you just gone overboard type of thing. And that's how Jesus lived his everyday life. Who is my family except them who do the will of my father? I was sharing with an individual. Um, this was probably about a week ago. I was sharing with them. I said, yes, family is important and all. It is very important. However, if you're saved and your family members are not, when you die and they die, you're going to one place and they're going to another. And you're going to have to spend time with that family that you probably didn't think so much of, which was the family of God, and you got to spend all eternity with them. But you're thankful because you don't have to spend eternity with your unsaved loved ones that you tried to convince to get saved, but they refused or they rejected they gave themselves over to the lifestyle that they were living, and that lifestyle took them to the place that they never thought they would ever go to. So Jesus was like, who is my family? Who is my mother? Who is my father? Who are my brothers? Save these who do the will of my father. Isn't that something? It's just like this meeting here. Who is? Well, Jesus himself went to the cross, not because he did anything wrong, because he did everything right. He obeyed the Father in everything that he did. He was obedient, as the writer in the book of Hebrews says, he was obedient in all things, even unto death, the death of the cross. So Jesus going to the cross was in full obedience to the commandment of the Father. The Bible also says that Minister Posada was quoting, I think it was Minister Posada or Minister Patton. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so Jesus, when he went to the cross, it wasn't because he had sin in his life. It was because he was becoming the, the sin bearer of the entire world. And so Sin did not have a hold on him or anything in common with him. He just became. He became what was 
typifying under the old covenant of the animal sacrifices that were offered up daily, brought to the priest, and the priest would slay the animal and spill the blood out because of the sins of the people because the soul that sent it shall die. So if we didn't die then, you had to bring forth a sacrifice. Somebody had to die as a result of the sin. So they would offer up the animal in the person's place. So here you have Jesus now being prepared to be crucified on the cross. And it's not because he sinned. It's because the entire world, which was created by him, the entire world, which was created by him, was in sin. And there had to be a sacrifice that would be acceptable unto God for that person's sin, because the person that sinned deserved death right then and there. So they'd bring that sacrifice and offer it up, and that shed blood of that sacrifice being acceptable unto God did not take away the sin, but covered the sin. This sacrifice, Jesus himself took away the sin. No longer was it John's baptism with water unto repentance. That was a turning to God. But now this sacrifice comes with, this baptism comes with the remission of sin. The forgiveness of sin. That sin would be wiped out totally and completely for those who put their trust in this sacrificial lamb that God provided himself. So now when we come to Jesus, we come to that cross. And what gets crucified is our old life, the old sinful life. That gets crucified on the cross. That is where we die. We die to that sinful lifestyle. And we don't remain dead, but we get raised in newness of life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that not only covers our sins, but forgives us of our sin and removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. We'll never be judged for those sins again. For the judgment was executed upon Jesus on the cross. So now do we live or continue in sin because of this grace that God has given us? Paul says, God forbid in Romans chapter 6, how shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? That just right there blows away probably 90% of the church because we still believe that we're okay in that sinful state. And we're not. We're not even recreated for that. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are brand new and all things are of God. We're no longer a slave to sin. Sin doesn't own us. Sin is not our master. Jesus is our master. And by faith, we live. Ha! For the just shall live by what? We are declared righteous now before God. We are declared the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We now have a right to position ourselves as sons and daughters of the Most High God. We don't have to send the high priest in. We don't have to send the priest in. You go. You worship God. Even as it was with Moses on the mountain. You go up there. God's got lightning bolts. He's got fire on top of that mountain. We're not going up. We're too afraid. Now we can all come boldly before the throne of God. Tell your neighbor, come boldly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've been forgiven. Our sins have been remitted. We are clean now. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Why would we go and dirty up what God has cleaned up? Who likes a clean car? Even if we drive a dirty car, we still like a clean car. I mean, our cars just seem to attract bird poop. Go and get it cleaned, bring it home. Within two days, one of the birds have come by. It's like they wait to drop a bomb on it because they don't want it to look good. Thank you. And so it's like we're just going to drive this anyways. And the poop irritates me. And I know if it irritates me, it irritates Pastor Lucia. But it's like, if I get out there and wash it, I'm ready to bring out my BB gun. I'm ready to go back to the old life and start shooting. But I'm not, because that's the old man. I've been delivered from that. But don't think it doesn't cross my mind. The temptation there, hey, it's in the garage. It's right on this. I know exactly where the gun is, and I know exactly where the BBs are. They're in separate places. That means I really got to sin if I put those things together. But to go out there and put in all that exercise, and then to see one, as a matter of fact, they don't even do it when we're out there. It's like after we come outside, maybe a day or so, it's like, these birds don't like this car. My thinking, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're, they're just birds. So we just drive and we just enjoy. But the whole thing about it is this. You know, if you had a choice of driving a clean car or a dirty car, which car are you going to take? Amen. Every time. Every time. And that's what God expects of his people. I want a people who's clean, holy, and right. So I'm going to help them. I'm going to give them exactly what they need in order to do what I expect of them. Because he wants a clean vessel that he may inhabit and glorify his name through. That's just a bit of an introduction. Today's message is called The Promise. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 49, 24, I should say. Sorry about that. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Again, we're going back to talking about the Holy Ghost. We got our shirts on today. We're sporting our shirts. Amen. Everybody see our new shirts? Praise God. I think we still have some back there. They are uh, $20 a piece. $20? Praise God. It's, It's worth more than that. Hallelujah. $20 $20 a piece or $17 each for three or more. And if you'd like to have one and buy or, you know, you don't have the funds to get it, just, you know, fill out a cart and say, I'd like to have one or two or something like that. And if we have extra ones, uh, somebody will put it up for you. Amen. We have enough givers in this place that will help you out. Some of y'all be getting helped out a lot. I'd be finding out later down the road that somebody did this for somebody. I'm like, wow, praise God. They didn't even say nothing. But uh, we have some people in this house that do believe in helping others out. So if you, if it's too much, too expensive for you, by all means, just fill out a card or something. Give it to Minister Patton, and uh, we'll see what we can do. If we run out of shirts, then we can just give you one of the old shirts, and you could just wear that. Amen? Amen. So the promise. Everybody say the promise. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, these are the words of Christ that are letter, red letters. And behold, take notice, pay attention, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Everybody heard those words? 
Was it on the screen that you could read it along with me? Everybody knows who spoke those words. Thank you, Jesus. And who is Jesus to you? Everything. Messiah, your Lord, personal, your Lord. Nobody else claiming you claim he's your Lord. Glory to God. No, that's nothing bad about that. He's my Lord. You know, the older generation would say, my Lord. Even when you're preaching, my Lord. Praise God, my Lord. They're bragging about their Lord. But he says, I send the promise of my Father. So who made the promise? Okay. I've heard Father, 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 uh, Jesus, and all of that. He says right here, the Father. So in other words, this is part of God's plan for redemption of mankind. Jesus is the one who is chosen in order to go forth and carry out this plan and to ratify it by his own precious blood. Jesus knows that he is the lamb, the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that takes away the sin of the entire world. Without Jesus, we wouldn't even be allowed into the kingdom. You'd have the Jews, you had the Hebrew tribes of Israel, if you will. You'd have them still partaking of the um, of being the people of God, if you will. And the word would simply apply to them. They would operate under the old covenant, and they would be offering up sacrifices daily for their sins that were committed daily. But now that Jesus has come, the door has been opened even unto the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say glory for that. Because now we all have access. Access to what? We now have access to the Father. We, are, we now have access to heaven. Heaven is a real place. The earth is a real place. And God wants to intervene in the earth. Sin separated, cut off. But God's mercy, grace, and pre-planned purpose was going to be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So the Father said, in this plan, Jesus, we're going to send my spirit, the Holy Spirit, the very spirit that will empower you to do works, because although you are God the Son, the Son of God, when you go down there, you're going to operate as man. And you're only going to be able to do what we are agreeing to right here, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit who will dwell in you and clothe you and help you to carry out what our plan is. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. So in the plan, the Father says, and just like I give you the Holy Ghost in order to complete this mission, remember Jesus, I'm taking my time here and I got time, so don't be all weary or nervous or definitely don't ignore what I'm saying. So the Father in his plan saying, just like I've empowered you with the Holy Ghost, when you walk on this earth, you are very God, but you will be very man. And you will do the things that you will do by the power of the Spirit. Just like I did that with you, I'm going to do it with all of them. So as Jesus is coming to the conclusion of his earthly ministry, he has, well, this, by this time he has resurrected from the dead. But he told them in John chapter 14, 15, 16, preparing them for the Holy Ghost who would come, the helper, the comforter. He says, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Next verse we want to look at is Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and it reads as follows. You can take notes or you can listen to the message again. It will be out there on uh, uh, podcasts and just out there on YouTube and maybe even Facebook. 
But it reads as follows, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. The same person who wrote the book of Luke is the same person who wrote the book of Acts. And he reiterates what Jesus has said. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. Acts chapter 1 verse 5. I'm going to move quickly. Acts chapter 1 verse 5. For John truly baptized with water. And that water was unto repentance. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, listen to this and listen carefully, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So where shall they be witnesses? I'll give you an opportunity to talk back to me real quick. Who spoke these words? And he spoke it concerning the church of the living God, the body of Christ. As he said, upon this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia, comprised of those who are called out. Called out of what? Called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Called from the power of sin unto the power of Almighty God. Called from the sway of Satan unto Almighty God. He's saying, but ye shall receive power. That word power is the Greek word dudamus. It is that explosive power get, coming from the word dynamite, if you will. Dunamis power, power that has great influence, power like those uh, who are very wealthy wield their power in life, in society. He says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, Jesus wanted the gospel to be preached in all the world. Can you agree? Verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Does anybody see anything missing in that statement that Peter has made? Okay, I heard it from two people. From Samaria and from the uttermost parts of the world, of the earth. Those two are missing in this statement that Peter is making to the people. It wasn't so much that you know, see false doctrine or something like that. It's just where their concentration was and where the Lord's concentration was. Peter then were concerned with their own people. We find that out when we get to Acts chapter 10. When he goes to the house of Cornelius, now he's got the revelation after Jesus has to unfold the sheet of all of the uh, unclean animals and said, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. So they're limited in what their view is, but God's view has always been a worldview. God has already always had his mind, his heart set upon redeeming the greatest of all his creation who were created in his image and after his likeness. And he wanted them to dominate and rule over the earth just like he rules in heaven. It is up to the church to claim, to claim, to I got to say this right. 
It is up to the church of the living God in order to change the climate. They want to talk about climate change. Here's some climate change for them from heaven. You see, the church is not worried about, you know, the, the, the icebergs and all the, the, what do they call them? Do they call them just icebergs up there in Alaska and all of that? Glaciers, glaciers and all. We ain't worried about that melting down and then flooding out the earth. Why aren't we worried about that? Because that ain't the way God says it's going to end. We believe God's word over man's word any day, any time, any word, any hour, any moment. We are hooked into God, and that's the way he wants his people, all of his people. This is not just something, well, you know, you've just gone too far. You're just too far. Fast. No, we haven't gone far enough as the people of God. When we get to where Peter them were, we're scratching the surface. Because the glory of the latter should exceed the former. And under, in their time and in their day, they, they, they referred the glory of the former as the building made of hands. As the temple Solomon built. As with Zerubbabel them in rebuilding the temple. Even in the day that Jesus was on the earth, it was about Herod having rebuilt the temple. Oh, Lord, look at how marvelous this temple is. And Jesus is saying to them, you know, there's going to come a day that not one stone shall remain upon another. So don't be caught up into that. When he was speaking to the woman at the well, he says, the hour has come and now is when the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. Because that's what the Father is seeking after. So it won't be about a physical building. But Paul, with the revelation of God by the Holy Ghost, says that we are God's building. This is where the glory of the latter house shall exceed the glory of the former. Because Christ would be in us the hope of glory. When we talk about um, Paul saying it like this, my little children are whom I labor and travail and birth pains again until Christ be fully formed in you. It is where Christ takes over this life. And until Christ does so, that means we're in charge. We do what we want, when we want, how we want, wherever we want. We just do our own thing. But the people of God, in carrying out great exploits, it ain't about building a nice building. It's about turning the cities and nations upside down with the good news of Jesus Christ, with the accompanying signs following them as they preach God's word. How are we going to do it? In our own strength? No, Jesus said it. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be, he's making us effective witnesses unto him. Everybody who agreed said amen. So Peter acknowledges Judea and Jerusalem. He leaves out Samaria, which they were at odds with. Because they felt like they were better than the Samaritans. And then the other post, uttermost parts of the world where the Gentiles were as if the Gentiles aren't worthy of this great gift of salvation that God gives. Okay, verse 15. So Peter's preaching this powerful sermon, mind you, three-minute sermon that gets 3,000 souls saved. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, or nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that, verse 16 of Acts chapter 2, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So hundreds of years before this manifestation, Joel, by the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon him to prophesy and declare in the last days. In the midst of God's people being in trouble once again. The Lord has said in the last days, he's going to pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. 
Verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Listen to this. Your sons are going to be impacted by this. Your daughters are going to be impacted by this. Your young men are going to be impacted by this. Your old men are going to be impacted by this. My servants are going to be impacted by this. My handmaidens are going to be impacted by this. In other words, nobody's going to be spared as long as they get in the course of where the river's flowing. Hallelujah. 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 And if we need more proof, Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father... The promise of the Holy Ghost. Who is the promise? Now, God made promises. He made promises to Abraham. He made promises to others throughout Scripture. But this promise is unlike the other promises. Because this is God saying, I'm going to put myself in my people. It's not going to be the color of the skin. It's not going to be what area you were raised up in. Has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with your pedigree or background or lack thereof. It has everything to do with the willing heart who's ready to receive, just like I was earlier saying, who's receiving? Who's receiving? Why? Because God is pouring out. God is doing something. God is filling us up. I I don't see it. I don't feel it. Raise your hands in faith and believe it. It's not, God's not waiting on you to feel or something because you won't even move by the feeling. The feeling lifts and you go right back. And it's like, no, this, what God is doing takes us higher. What God is doing transforms and changes us, makes us into that new creation, new things, greater things, none of the old stuff. The old is old, obsolete, no longer necessary. Get rid of the baggage. Let it go. Tell your neighbor, let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. It ain't worth holding on. It ain't worth, you know how we are? I got stuff that I had. I even got suits that I've had for like years. But like God did with the children of Israel, he made sure that their clothing didn't wear out and their shoes didn't get too bad on their feet. So they're still good. <laughs> they're not bell bottoms. So as long as they're not bell bottoms, I think they're still okay to wear. They're not flares either. Side trip won't cost you anything. Okay, so why are you yelling? Because it's burning within me. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, which is at the place of power, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see, and which you now hear. Where? How did we get off track of what God released to the church of the living God? in order to continue and finish the work that he's given us on our watch. Where did we find the lack of necessity that we could do without what God was trying to put within us? <laughs> it's it's got to come to the place to where we come to the end of ourselves so that we can live for the glory of God. We lost too many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ through COVID. When I say lost, I'm not talking about they died because they went on to glory if they were in God and God was in them. But so many have, like you would say, how do you, how do you use that expression, fall off the wagon or something like that? You know how it is when you have a person who was hooked on uh, an alcoholic and all, and then, you know, they quit. They got, you know, whatever they did. They went to AA or something like that, and they were good, and they were going good, and then all of a sudden they had another drink. They fell off the wagon or something. You understand what I mean by that? 
we had so many fall off the wagon that that's one of the main sermons you hear from others throughout the body of Christ in trying to tell God's people it's time to come back to church because they have become so comfortable in just staying in their own home and watching by live stream or just going through to find their favorite preacher or the one that they like or the one that they're drawn to and attracted to. And it's amazing the stuff that's been happening with some of these preachers. I don't, be, I don't mean to be up here to bash preachers because I'm one myself. But to see the stuff that is happening with many of them in the body of Christ, it is pathetic. It's a sad, sad state. And if that's what's going on in the pulpit, you can only imagine what's going on in the pew. So you, you have all of these things happening, and it's like, how did we get so off course? And how did we get so confident in being off course? How do we get so confident in operating apart from the Holy Ghost? They put pressure and persecution upon the church of the living God. I like the way Smith Wigglesworth said it. Smith Wigglesworth said the church was okay until the Holy Ghost came. He said when they got baptized with the Holy Ghost, that's when all the persecution came. But by that time, it was too late. Because by that time, the, the 120 became 3,000, the 3,000 to 5,000. And when they get persecuted, they go, they're, they're scattered all over the place. But everywhere they went, they were preaching the word. Sons and daughters, old men, young men. Handmaidens, servants, they all went prophesying the word of the Lord wherever they went. Can we do that today? Because I know the E-team has a, I, I, I do guard and protect y'all. I love the ones that run out there and go. But it is hard to get people to actively participate in evangelism. Well, I don't want to, you know, that's not me. Are you a son? Are you a daughter? That's you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whether you go out at nighttime with them or on a Saturday with them or whether just everywhere you go, you are just an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. They went out Friday night. How many got saved? Did any get saved? But you got a chance to minister to people. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. Sister Jernigan witnessed to her aunt and led her aunt to the saving knowledge of truth. How old is she, Sister J? 94? 94 years old. 94. 94. And received and prayed the prayer of salvation. Name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. She can go any day, any time, any hour, any moment, any minute. Now she's going on the glory. But it's like availing ourselves for what we've been empowered to do. Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Start prophesying. You're a young man? I hear a few of those, yes. I'll go ahead and acknowledge it. Are you an old man? Yeah. According to what you think. <laughs> no, 63 this year. Be 63, and I thank God for every one of those years, especially those that were spent in him. But we want to go out blazing as the people of God. If the rapture doesn't take place in our time, we want to go out blazing. In other words, still on fire for God, still loving God, still praising him, still honoring him, still speaking on his behalf, being a representation of him in the earth. This ain't one of those things where you get burnt out. This is one of those things where you get consumed in his presence and power, and he just keeps you going. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. Therefore, I, I'm telling you, when I, when I saw that, it didn't come to me until we were just driving here, getting ready to make that right turn on Vineyard, that I said, Pastor Lucia, why I call it love. Look, was it last Sunday when I said about when you leave, they're going to miss you? And she says, yes. And I said, I wonder if that's connected to what happened with, with Brian. This whole sermon is not about him. But it, it, it's like, it just blessed me so to see that after 35 years, almost 35 years, if not 35 years, he sends an offering? Hmm. Praise be unto God. I'm almost done. He said that before. No, I really am. Even if I didn't say it before, I, I really am. I'm almost done. Okay. So, Peter says, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, because they're like, well, what must we do? Peter said to them, repent, which means turn from the errors of your way and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. For the remission of sins. Remission is the forgiveness of sins. Up until Jesus, you could only have your sins covered. But now with Jesus, you are forgiven. You are free. Someone who's guilty of something and somebody comes along and pardons them, they know what it's like to be free from that guilt. They knew they were guilty. They knew they were wrong. And yet someone says, I now set you free. And that's what Jesus does for us. He sets us free. Free from what? Free from all of the mess. Free from the sin. Free from everything that sin brought on. You were violated. You're free from that now. Why am I constantly, you know, bothered by and troubled by it? Because you won't die at the cross. When you die at the cross, you die to the offenses. You die to the wrongdoings, to the being done wrong. You die to all of those things that are a stumbling block to you. You die to bad relationships. You die to abuse. You die to mistreatment. You die to rejection. You die to that mess. And if you don't die, it lives with you. Because when you, if you're still alive, if you, if you don't reckon, Paul said it like this, reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. How plain can that get? I don't, what does that look like? Now, I know God is tired of hearing that stuff about what does that look like in the church. It's in the world. It infiltrates the world. But when it comes to the church, it's like you depend upon the divine revelation of the Holy Ghost. If you don't understand something, you've got such a relationship with the Holy Ghost because you've been spending time with him in prayer, allowing him to change and transform you. I do it too. He's got to transform me. Hello. And he ain't done until glory time. So he's healing you as you're spending time with him. He's healing you as you pray. He's healing you as you are transparent before God because he already knows everything that's going on in your heart, in your life, in your mind. He knows our thoughts. Listen to this. Grab a hold of this. He knows our thoughts are far off. Now, don't be stupid and ask God, how far is afar? How about this, as far as the east is from the west? I didn't call nobody stupid. I just said, don't be. 
You're too intelligent for that. And what you don't know and what you don't understand, guess who's with you? Guess who's with you? Guess who's there to give you understanding? You know, the Bible says, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. And guess who's there to give you wisdom and understanding? Guess who's there to give you revelation? Guess who's there to strengthen and fortify you so that you can face the very enemy that knocked you down the day before, but you're standing right in their face today and not bending, not bowing, not moving, not crying, not doing any of those things. <sighs> Say, Holy Ghost, you're my friend. You're my helper. You're my comforter. You are my intercessor. You're my advocate. You're my counselor. I'll lay on your couch and not some psychiatrist or psychologist's couch. I'll let you comfort me. I'll let you console me. I'll let you advise me on what I should do. That's called building that relationship with the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to complain to nobody. I'm taking this direct to God. Hallelujah. There's some stuff you don't want people to know anyways. Amen? Aren't you glad the Holy Ghost just doesn't expose all of our business and everything that we've done, every thought that we've had? Prayerfully, we repent in the closet that we can get cleansed and washed of it and haven't released it. Because we release it, that gives life to it. And wherever those seeds go, they sprout. They sprout in somebody else's ear. Somebody else, am I making any sense? They sprout in somebody else's ear. Germinate and produce. This is how bitterness goes from one person to the next. Infects, if you're not careful, it'll infect the entire congregation. And no matter how many, <laughs> not referencing what Minister D just said, no matter how many hallelujahs, my hallelujah. Minister Posada could sing that till the glory fills this place and we're all laid out. But if Minister Posada has bitterness in his heart, it is no good for any of us. It's not even good for God. Worship leaders, don't you know God wants your heart pure, sanctified, clean before him? Hallelujah. Don't you know that he wants you to prepare? That's the only way y'all take us higher and take us deeper. He wants you to prepare yourself before you come before God's people. Just like we have to prepare ourselves before we come before you. He wants us to have spent some time with him. Some quality time. Quality leads to quantity. You, you can take that statement down. You, you can take that. I don't know anybody else said that, but if they did, I didn't get it from them. It just came up right now. Quality brings you to quantity. Hallelujah. Yeah, I know it, it feels so good, but I, it ain't me, and, and I can't take credit. So I'm going to say this, and I'm going to stop because I don't want to go overboard with the spirit of the living God. He says this, then Peter said to them, repent. Listen, that is a wonderful word for believers. It is. It might, it might bring up shame and humiliation for something we have said or something that we have done. But it is necessary to break the effects of what we said or what we did or what somebody did to us. Repent because with repent comes release. Release from the bondage. Release from the offense. Release from the hurt. Repent. It, 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 repent brings on forgiveness. And that forgiveness that comes on you is forgiveness that cleanses you of all unrighteousness. Just washes you. You whiter than snow. You clean. You're like the clean car. Get an umbrella so the birds don't poop on you. Amen? Keep yourself pure. Hallelujah. That's what James said. 
And Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness and the flesh because we can be dirty in our spirit. I'm not talking about the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about our human spirit. We can be dirty in our spirit, and we need cleansing there too. Share it with you about the game. You can sit there and watch that game, enjoy that game, shout, root for Steph, and be upset when Steph be blowing it, or Clay being back now, and Clay's playing like the, the old Clay who can just go off at the moment and just hit them three pointers, and he just, you know, you can be all, all into it. You can tell I've been into it. You can be all into it and watching. I don't even like to watch the other teams anymore. You can be all in. And I was used to them be a Warriors friend because I always felt like the Warriors are just good entertainers, but they can't win a championship. Then when they won three, they got me. They got my interest. But you can be so all into that. And all I've done is entertain myself. I have not entertained God whatsoever. Well, is there anything wrong? We ain't supposed to have no fun. You're supposed to enjoy life. I mean, you got abundant life. You're supposed to enjoy. You, you got more than anybody else has got who's not saved. So if anybody ought to be able to enjoy life, that life is with him. That life is in the sun. So when you have that, and please don't think that I'm, you know, just receive, just receive, just receive. And, and so you, 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 you have that abundant life in you. But it's like this life is precious. This life, it doesn't even belong to me anymore. It's no longer my life. It belongs to God. So if I sit there and entertain myself all day and ignore God, I have messed up big time. I need to go get my diaper changed because I have pooped all over myself. You understand what I mean? But if I give God what is his, if I honor him, if I acknowledge him in all my ways, He's going to direct my path, and he'll let me because he'll give me the desires of my heart. My priorities just have to be straight. It ain't all about me. I'm just using myself as an example. This is one of those me too moments. Come on, me too. I got to give God what he deserves, what is rightfully his. This day and what we offered up today, that pleased God. Now, don't go out here and sin. Go out and enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Go out and enjoy what God has blessed you with. Go out and enjoy. Don't sin, but enjoy. And let the goodness of God just take over and just carry you to where people look at you and like, man, you really got it together. And you be transparent. No, I don't. But God keeps it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God keeps this together. He's able to keep me from stumbling or falling, Brother Joseph. Hallelujah. He's a better keeper than I ever will be. This is a me too moment. Come on, church. Me too. We got to trust in God. Trust in his word. Trust in the power of the Holy Ghost dwelling within us, being with us. Because some of the stuff we will entertain ourselves with, he's like, you know, And if ever you find me imitating the world more than I would imitate Christ, I need to be rebuked. Find somebody in an office that is able to rebuke me. Get me set straight. You'll never find me like that as long as I am walking in the grace and power, influence of the Holy Ghost, in relationship with God. Hallelujah. But those are the... Those are the types of things that we have to be careful of because we can look at it as, well, this is my body. I do what I want with it. And it's like, no, it's not. I don't mean to break your heart. I don't mean to, you know, just make you feel bad. I'm not judging you. 
It's a truth. That body, Sister Gabby, is not yours. That body, Minister Killings, is not yours. That body, Princess Sissy, is not yours. All of y'all can point at me and say, that body, Apostle, is not yours. Come on, I gave you a chance to, you know, well, let me hit him with something. He's hitting me with stuff. And I'm really not hitting. I'm just enjoying what God is trying to feed us with so we can grow and we can flow with God like never before. That we become unrecognizable. The only thing people rep recognize is Jesus is amongst them. Leave him alone. Hallelujah. Glory. Okay. We'll stop for today. Not out of word, not out of time. Well, not really out of time, but we'll be back for prayer tonight. And there's, there's much more, but I feel like this has been good and sufficient. Hallelujah. Every time I put these glasses on, I keep seeing how foggy they are. But out of habit, I do that. And I notice others do that as well. I, I, I really want to, I really want to keep going, but I, I, I will stop. I know Sister Finn will be one of the first ones who's already vouched. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. I know the fan will be sitting there. Everybody be gone. Keep going, Apostle. Keep going. We ain't got but 30 more minutes till prayer time. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Gosh. The promise. Amen. Stand to your feet. The promise. You have the promise. Hallelujah. Never forget that. Minister Mays and Brother OCL want you all to have communion before you go home today. So they are circling the tabernacle in order to disperse it. Go ahead and do so. If you have time to have uh, communion with us, by all means, do so. I will say this. It's not a mandate. It's not a, um, a requirement. But Jesus says, as oft as you do it. And if you can do it daily, do it daily. Amen. Thank you. I receive that in Jesus' name. If you can do it daily, do it daily. Because it's a constant reminder of your communion and fellowship with God and what Jesus has done for you and what he wants to do for others as well. Having it on the first Sunday, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you don't have it more than once a month, it, it, I'm, I want to say... It's fine, but in your growing, in your drawing closer to God, it really blesses your fellowship and communion with him. Because for that, for sure, you're going to be in his presence at least once a day. Hallelujah, if not more. They say the average prayer time for a pastor is five minutes a day. And, um, you know, I, I know I've shared that before. But it doesn't have to be five minutes a day. We don't ever have to busy ourselves so much that we have no time to get before God, especially we who are ministers of the gospel. Saints need to do it as well, because the more we do, the stronger we are. Every believer, a minister, ministering on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Has everyone been served? Yes, okay, I got a thumbs up back there. Um, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and passed it along them and said, take and eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we do take of this bread, Lord Jesus, for you all the bread of life. You are the true manna from heaven that everyone who eats of this bread, partaking of your body, they shall never die. So as we do this, we do this in your honor and proclaim your glory. You were wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon you and with your stripes we are healed. 
So we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to break bread with the family of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that healing will manifest anything and everything that ills them or irks them or just hinders them in their walk and relationship with you or with one another. Lord, we pray for the removal of all those things that even through communion, the love of God, the love for you and the love for one another can just flood our hearts and minds and healing can spring forth speedily in the lives of your people that we're not so messed up that we are ineffective for you, but we are growing and getting stronger even as the day goes by. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Glory be to God. So bless the bread now as we eat. Let's go ahead and eat together. And the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of your blood shed for many for the remission of sin. Without the shedding of your blood, there is no remission of sin. It is the cup of redemption, for we've not been redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with your precious blood as of a lamb without blemish or spot. Lord Jesus, you said this blood is the this cup is the blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And we thank you that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we love our lives not unto death. Bless us as we drink. Let's drink together. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible. To the only wise God be glory and honor forever and ever. And everybody who agreed said amen. amen. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. His name be over you and your household that he may bless you. That you may enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Above all else you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That the gates of hell will never prevail against you, but you will always triumph over the gates of hell because of who you are and whose you are, the church of the living God, the body of Christ. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be back here at the altar at 6 p.m. Glory.